Well, good evening, Colts. This is Mrs. Haladin. It is Friday, and it's great to see you. I'm sorry this video is going to come out a little bit later. I came home from work and took a nap. So, there you go. I've got on my Colt Spirit Wear today. Um, it was super fun seeing everybody in their Colt gear, and I loved that so many people participated. So, keep an eye out for that padlet that has all the pictures that were submitted. Um, today, I'm going to do a little more reading from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And maybe you can hear some noise in the background. My husband's making hamburgers, so sorry if that's distracting. Life goes on, as you know. All right, so we're on chapter 9, and I think we're going to read um, chapters 9 and 10 today. And um, the last chapter we read, it was Charlie's birthday, and they all were very anxiously awaiting to see if Charlie might be lucky enough to get one of the golden tickets. And um, he did not get it with his birthday uh, chocolate, which was really a bummer. And then in the story, the author talked a little bit about the other characters um, who did get golden tickets, and maybe we'll learn more about them later. But generally speaking, they were all obnoxious, and um, the grandparents had quite a bit to say about that. Anyways, let's read chapter 9. This is titled, Grandpa Joe Takes a Gamble. The next day, when Charlie came home from school and went to see his grandparents, he found that only Grandpa Joe was awake. The other three were all snoring loudly. Shh, whispered Grandpa Joe, and he beckoned Charlie to come closer. Charlie tiptoed over and stood beside the bed. The old man gave Charlie a sly grin, and then he started rummaging under his pillow with one hand. And when the hand came out again, there was an ancient leather purse cl clutched in the fingers. Under the cover of the bedclothes, the old man um, opened the purse and tipped it upside down. Out fell a single silver ten cent piece. It's my secret hoard, he whispered. The others don't know I've got it. And now you and I are going to have one more fling at finding that last ticket. How about it, eh? But you'll have to help me. Are you sure you want to spend your money on that, Grandpa? Charlie whispered. Of course I'm sure, spluttered the old man excitedly. Don't stand there arguing. I'm just as crazy as you are to find that ticket. Here, take the money and run down the street to the nearest store and buy the first Wonka candy bar you see and bring it straight back to me and we'll open it together. Charlie took the little silver coin and slipped quickly out of the room. In five minutes, he was back. Have you got it, whispered Grandpa Joe, his eyes shining with excitement. Charlie nodded and held out the bar of candy. Wonka's nutty crunch surprise, it said on the wrapper. Good, the old man whispered sitting up in the bed and rubbing his hands. Now, come over here and sit close to me and we'll open it together. Are you ready? Yes, said Charlie, I'm ready. All right, you tear off the first bit. No, Charlie said, you paid for it, you do it all. The old man's fingers were trembling most terribly as they fumbled with the candy bar. We don't have a hope, really, he whispered, giggling a bit. You do know we don't have a hope, don't you? Yes, Charlie said, I know that. They looked at each other and both started giggling nervously. Mind you, said Grandpa Joe, there is just that tiny chance that it might be the one. Don't you agree? Yes, Charlie said, of course. Why don't you open it, Grandpa? All in good time, my boy, all in good time. Which end do you think I ought to open first? That corner, the furthest one from you. Just tear off a tiny bit, but not quite enough for us to see anything. Like that, said the old man. Yes, now a little bit more. You finish it, said Grandpa Joe. I'm too nervous. No, Grandpa, you must do it yourself. Very well, then. Here goes. He tore off the wrapper. They both stared at what lay underneath. It was a bar of candy, nothing more. All at once, they both saw the funny side of the whole thing, and they burst into peals of laughter. What the heck's going on, cried Grandma Josephine, waking up suddenly. Nothing, said Grandpa Joe. You go back to sleep. Ah, oh, what a bummer. I thought that might have been it. Not yet. Chapter 10. The family begins to starve. During the next two weeks, the weather turned very cold. First came the snow. It began very suddenly one morning, just as Charlie Bucket was getting dressed for school. Standing by the window, he saw the huge flakes drifting slowly down out of an icy sky that was the color of steel. By evening, it lay four feet deep around the tiny house, and Mr. Bucket had to dig a path from the front door to the road. After the snow, there came a freezing gale that blew for days and days without stopping, and oh, how bitter cold it was. 
Everything that Charlie touched seemed to be made of ice, and each time he stepped outside the door, the wind was like a knife on his cheek. Inside the house, little jets of freezing air came rushing in through the sides of the windows and under the doors, and there was no place to go to escape them. The four old ones lay silent and huddled in their bed, trying to keep the cold out of their bones. The excitement over the golden tickets had long since been forgotten. Nobody in the family gave a thought now to anything except two vital problems of trying to keep warm and trying to get enough to eat. There's something about very cold weather that gives one an enormous appetite. Most of us find ourselves beginning to crave rich steaming stews and hot apple pies and all kinds of delicious warming dishes. And because we're all a great deal luckier than we realize, we usually get what we want or near enough. But Charlie Bucket never got what he wanted because his family couldn't afford it. And as the cold weather went on and on, he became ravenously and desperately hungry. Both bars of candy, the birthday one and the one Grandpa Joe had bought, had long since been nibbled away. And all he got now were those thin cabbage meals three times a day. Then all at once, the meals became even thinner. The reason for this was that the toothpaste factory, the place where Mr. Bucket worked, suddenly went bust and it had to close down. Quickly, Mr. Bucket tried to get another job, but he had no luck. In the end, the only way in which he managed to earn a few pennies was by shoveling snow in the streets, but it wasn't enough to buy even a quarter of the food that seven people needed. The situation became desperate. Breakfast was a single slice of bread for each person now, and lunch was maybe half a boiled potato. Slowly but surely, everyone in the house began to starve. And every day, little Charlie Bucket, trudging through the snow on his way to school, would have to pass Mr. Willy Wonka's giant chocolate factory. And every day, as he came near to it, he would lift his small pointed nose high in the air and sniff the wonderful sweet smell of melting chocolate. Sometimes he would stand motionless outside the gates for several minutes on end, taking deep swallowing breaths as though he could eat the smell itself. That child, said Grandpa Joe, poking his head up from under the blanket one icy morning, that child has got to have more food. It doesn't matter about us. We're too old to bother with. But a growing boy, he can't go on like this. He's beginning to look like a skeleton. All right, here's a picture of, I think these are the doors of the Wonka factory that Charlie was stopping by on his way to school. They're very ornate and fancy. Oh yeah, sorry, as I look again, I think this is little Charlie right here, looking up at the doors. Look at how giant they are. They're huge, that's a person. The big, big doors. What can one do, murmured Grandma Josephine miserably. He refuses to take any of ours. I hear his mother try to slip her own piece of bread onto his plate at breakfast this morning, but he wouldn't touch it. He made her take it back. It's a fine little fellow, said Grandpa George. He deserves better than this. The cruel weather went on and on. And every day, Charlie Buck Bucket grew thinner and thinner. His face became frighteningly white and pinched. His, the skin was drawn so tightly over the cheeks that you could see the shapes of the bones underneath. It seemed doubtful whether he could go on much longer like this without becoming dangerously ill. And now, very calmly, with that curious wisdom that seems to come so often to small children in times of hardship, he began to make little changes here and there in some of the things he did as so to save his strength. In the mornings, he left the house 10 minutes earlier so he could walk slowly to school without ever having to run. He sat quietly in the classroom during recess, resting himself while others rushed outdoors and threw snowballs and wrestled in the snow. Everything he did now, he did slowly and carefully to prevent exhaustion. Then one afternoon, Walking back home with the icy wind in his face and incidentally feeling hungrier than, hungrier than he ever had before, his eye was caught suddenly by a piece of paper that was lying in the gutter in the snow. The paper was of a greenish color and there was something vaguely familiar about it. Charlie stepped off the curb and bent down to examine it. Part of it was buried under the snow, but he saw at once what it was. It was a dollar bill. Quickly, he looked around him. Had somebody just dropped it? No, that was impossible because of the way part of it was buried. 
Several people went hurrying past him on the sidewalk, their chins sunk deep into their collars of their coats, their feet crunching in the snow. None of them was searching for any money. None of them was taking the slightest notice of the small boy crouching in the gutter. Then it was his, this dollar. Could he have it? Carefully, Charlie pulled it out from under the snow. It was damp and dirty, but otherwise perfect. A whole dollar. He held it tightly between his shivering fingers, gazing down at it. It meant one thing to him at that moment, only one thing. It meant food. Automatically, Charlie turned and began moving toward the nearest shop. It was only 10 paces away. It was a newspaper and stationery store, the kind that sells almost everything, including candy and cigars. And what he would do, he whispered to himself, he would buy one luscious bar of candy and he'd eat it all up, every bit of it, right then and there. And the rest of the money he would take straight back home and give to his mother. And that's the end of chapter 10. We'll find out what happens when he goes to the store and buys some food. I'm glad he found that dollar. That was definitely a miracle for Charlie. All right, friends, I hope you have a really great weekend. I plan to continue to read over the weekend, so be sure you check back for more stories from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Take care, friends. Happy Friday. Bye.